Talks on the End of Life, a series of public forums on how to handle the challenges of aging and the final days. Number two in a series, How to Talk to Your Doctor, sponsored by St. Barnabas Episcopal Church with Hospice of Cincinnati. Thank you so much for asking me to come and be a part of this series. I think it's a great idea. And I hope I can um, help you a little bit today when we talk about how to talk to your doctor because I do wear two hats. I spend half my time doing um, hospice work, but the other half of the time I'm a practicing medical oncologist. So I see patients in the office and I appreciate how difficult it can be to navigate the waters of medical care these days. But I think it's important for you to know that the, there's a shift in, in medicine and you as the consumer are very, very important to the healthcare system and you will be polled to know what your experience was, were you happy with your experience in the office, uh, what can we do better to serve you. So, uh, you know, we're starting to recognize more that the patient really is our customer as well as our patient and we want to do a good job for you. So some, some of the things we're going to talk about are things that will help you have a better experience in the, in the doctor's office. Um, as you know, doctors are sort of in the driver's seat in, in healthcare, but that doesn't mean that you should fe feel bullied by the physician. But there are things that you can do to make yourself have a better experience, um, and there are things that I can help you understand that doctors like you to do to help you have a better experience. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And I would hope that at any point, if you have a question or a comment or you've had a situation that you felt uncomfortable with or had a good experience with, that you'll chime in and share that with everyone. So a partnership is built on communication and truly you're, you and your physician are partners and it's important to understand that and I help you best when we work together. So um, if you're looking for a doctor, and it could be you're looking for a primary care doctor, people move around, you may lose your primary care doctor, you may be looking for a specialist. It's important these days to make sure that you have a doctor who's in your network because you may be restricted by your insurance carrier to a certain selection of doctors. So make sure you pay attention to that um, and look within your network because it will cost you dearly to go outside your network. So you make, pay attention to that. You may want to find a physician who uses your preferred hospital. If you think that your uh, health care is going to involve admission to a hospital, um, you don't want to lose contact with your physician. You want to make sure that he works with that hospital or uh, is, this, uh, you know, is somehow associated with that hospital if it makes a difference to you. You may not have a preference. And many physicians will say it doesn't make any difference what hospital you go to. I'm not going there anyway. So go anywhere that you feel comfortable. Um, word of mouth recommendation can be very helpful, particularly uh, say you're dealing with diabetes management. You may talk to other people who have diabetes, that they've had an excellent experience with a certain physician, and that can help guide you to, to find the right physician. And everyone's different. Everyone has a different attitude about what they want in a physician, and what's right for your friend may not be right for you. The thing to be careful of is online reviews. Remember, the people who are most likely to go online are the people who are extremely happy or extremely unhappy. So you get the, the both ends of the spectrum. You don't get the, you know, most people are pretty happy, so they're not going to go online and fill out a survey. So take that all with a grain of salt. And if you look at most of the online surveys, um, someone may only have one star, they may only have one review. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. I don't know much about Angie's List. I know that's a subscription service. Maybe that uh, works a little bit differently, but um, you know, it always helps to ask around. One thing I do caution is that if um, someone tells you, oh, I love my doctor, he is the golf champion at my country club, may not be your best choice. Um, you do want someone who's actually in the office. Um, I know that um, uh, you know, Dr. Oz is very popular these days, but his, uh, there was a big profile about him in the New Yorker, and his colleagues said that they would not really recommend him as a surgeon anymore because he only operates one day a week. So, you know, I know he's doing well on television, but, you know, really, if you want someone to take out your gallbladder, you want someone who takes out gallbladders all day long because they're so good at it. If, uh, so, so that's the kind of thing to think about. We'll talk a little bit more about expertise later, but, um, you know, if you want somebody to manage your hypertension, you want someone who does hypertension all the time. 
You want someone who takes care of head and neck cancer, you want someone who does lots of head and neck cancer. The doctor should get to know you and what your health is normally like. So that's why you want to establish a relationship. And sometimes people say, well, I never go to my doctor because I don't need to. I'm fine. Well, that's great, and I'm glad you're healthy, but that's usually why they want you to come in once a year so they can at least lay eyes on you, talk to you, find out how you, what your lifestyle is, what your health, general health is. So if something does go wrong, they know what your baseline is. The other thing is if something goes really wrong, they may go, well, I don't even know who he is. He never comes in to see me. So they don't really, they're not really vested in, in your care. So um, you want to get to know the doctor. You want them to know who you are. Never, hate, never hesitate to change doctors because you're worried about hurting someone's feelings. Sometimes you just don't get along. And frankly, sometimes there are patients, I wish they would change doctors. <laughs> so it works both ways. <laughs> um, sometimes you just, you know, you just kind of don't mesh. You know, you have different attitudes about things. You might just not like someone's personality. It doesn't mean they're not a good doctor. and doesn't mean the patient is a difficult patient. Sometimes you just don't get along, and that's okay. Think about what you're looking for in a physician. And uh, sometimes it makes a difference because you're going to have a long-term relationship. Sometimes it's going to be a pretty short-term relationship, and you may not emphasize certain things as much. But some people really do care whether it's a male or a female. Um, some people care if you have evening hours because maybe that doesn't work for them to have to go during the day. I know we polled our patients in my oncology practice because we considered having evening hours. They didn't care. They really didn't care anything about coming in the evening. So we sort of nixed that idea. They were perfectly happy to come during the day. Um, proximity to your home. If this is some place you're going to go frequently, you may want to be close to your home because of the travel time. If it's some place you don't go very often or you're only going for a short period of time, maybe you need a procedure and you'll have to go for a couple of follow-up visits, maybe proximity doesn't make any difference to you. So it's really important to consider. I'm always surprised when people retire to very remote locations because when you get older, you need your doctors more. And if they're far away, it makes it very difficult. So that's always something to consider. Um, a group practice. You don't too, see too many single practitioners anymore in anything, whether it's primary care or a specialty. So most places are a group practice, and you should plan that you may see other physicians in the practice. So don't get too comfortable with just one person. Or, uh, and it's really just impossible to say, I only want to see Dr. X. I never want to have to see another doctor because it just isn't going to happen. So then things come up, and you have to see other physicians. Um, uh, does, your does your doctor have hospital privileges? That's a huge issue for your primary care doctor. So you, you, know, you need to establish early on if they go to the hospital, and if they don't go to the hospital, did they use the hospitalists, and what's their relationship with them? The hospitalists is a whole new uh, specialty now. These are physicians who are based at the hospital, so when you're admitted to the hospital, most of the primary care doctors no longer go to the hospital to see patients. So they use the hospitalists who are based there to see the patients. The problem I see is there's not good communication between the hospitalist and the primary care doctor. They can go online, they can look at your electronic medical record and see what's going on, but I guarantee you they don't do that every day. So you want to, you want to establish with your primary care doctor, if I'm in the hospital, I want to make sure that you have contact with the hospitalist and know exactly what happened. So that when I come back to you for follow-up, you're you know, you're, you're part of the team and you know what's going on. You don't want to walk in for a follow-up visit after you're in the hospital for a week with AFib and C. diff and a pulmonary embolus and you go in your doctor goes, so, what happened to you? You know, that's, you don't want to go through the whole thing. You want them to be up to speed on exactly what went, went on. So make sure you ask about that. And, and I think it's good to let them know that you know what, what happens and that you expect a certain level of care from them and a certain level of follow-up and you expect them to pay attention to you know what the hospitalist has done and you want them to be up to speed when you come in. Depending on your situation you may decide to interview several physicians. I, I've certainly had patients come you know I see patients all the time who are seeing more than one physician and choosing a physician and um, it, it's not unusual and, and sometimes I, I think it comes down to well this other doctor is closer to my house and I have to go to the office a lot, so I'm going to go to this other doctor. I really liked you. It was great. But, um, you know, for a variety of reasons they pick. Sometimes they come in and they go, oh, yeah, I love you. I'm coming to you. I don't care how far I have to drive. But 
if you're if it's important to you to really like your doctor and really establish a relationship, interview a couple of people and see you know who you like. Even a couple of people in the same practice, it would be worth talking to them. So understanding your relationship with the physician, you are the customer, but ultimately you are responsible for your health and your body. If you come into the office, I can make recommendations, I can tell you what to do, I can prescribe for you. I can't make you take your medicine. I can't make you follow your diet. I can't make you go out and exercise every day. And if I bring them up to you, it's not because I'm trying to badger you, it's because I'm trying to make you the healthiest you you can be. But ultimately, you've got to do it. And um, you, you have to understand that it's your responsibility, but at the same time, if you feel like you're not getting appropriate answers or care from your physician, it's also your responsibility to say, you know, I, I'm not understanding why you want me to have this procedure, or I don't understand why I need to get this x-ray, or why am I not getting blood tests every month like other people do? It's okay to ask those questions, but, but you have to be prepared for the answer, and if you don't understand the answer, make sure you ask them to repeat it or explain it or give you some materials to understand it. As a physician, we're there to educate you and help you make decisions. The, you know, the days when, when you went to the doctor and they just said, here, take this pill, come back in three weeks, are gone. We don't do that anymore. In fact, if I give you a prescription, I want you to understand what the name of the pill is, what it looks like, and what you take it for. Because if someone else asks you, you're responsible to know that. You're putting that medication in your body every day. You need to know what that is. A lady the other day, I was asking her, talking to her about her father or something, or husband, and, and we were talking about what medication he had. He, she goes, oh, you know, he just got a prescription for it. She goes, you know, it's a little white pill. <laughs> I said, no, I don't know. <laughs> and she says, really? <laughs> so it, it's funny, people don't expect us to really know a lot of things, but um, you need to know what, what you're taking and, and why. Um, know what you want for your health and ask what your doctor's goals are. You know, you need to, you know, you may say, I, I've had people who smoke and they say, you know what, I'm not going to give it up. I love it. I, I know it's bad for me, but I'm not going to give it up. Okay. At least we know where you stand. But don't let me talk about it. smoking cessation every time you come in. You just go, yeah, you're just wasting your time. Just, just say, you know what, thank you. I, I understand that and I appreciate it, but I'm not going to stop. So just, you know, be up front. Or if, if you're never going to lose weight, just tell me you're never going to lose weight. I'm still going to tell you you need to, but at least be honest and you know don't don't say I promise I'm gonna go out and walk every day and walk out and go I'm not gonna walk um, just you know be honest be up front if you, you know if you're taking medication and you don't like it or you, don't not take it and not tell the physician non-compliance is a huge problem for, for, for patients if they're not taking their medication we think you're taking it it's not working say they're taking treating your high blood pressure you're not really taking your pill because it makes you cough um, and they see your blood pressure going up and go, okay, we need to add in a second medication. So then they're adding in a second medication, and maybe you don't take that one either. Then they're wondering, like, oh my gosh, there's something really wrong here. I better look at their kidneys. Maybe they have, you know, renal hypertension. So be honest. If you're not going to take the pill, say, you know, I, I can't tolerate this pill. Could we find something else? But don't just not take it. In case you didn't know, a lot of times the pharmacies now send us letters and tell us you're not taking the pill because you didn't refill it. And they're, and they're starting about having little um, pill bottles that actually will log whether you took your pill or not. Now, how it knows whether you swallowed it or not, I don't know. But, you know maybe there are little cameras inside it. Um, this is key. Know your office staff. They're very helpful to you. And, I, you know, I, I always say the people who work at our front desk are probably the most important line between us and the, and the patient because they're the first people they talk to and how they're greeted and treated at that front desk is very, very important. And I always acknowledge how, what a great front staff I have and I always tell them how much I appreciate them being so nice to the patients because sometimes patients can be testy. You know, and a lot of our patients are all, many of them are very, very ill. Some of them aren't ill, they're just crabby, but you have to be nice to all of them. And frankly, I go to an office in the city and they are, renowned for having the nastiest front desk ever. And I can't understand it because it's a dermatology office. No one's even sick. 
They just come in with a rash. And they're not even nice to you when you check in. And I am always so overly nice. I'm always on time. I fill out all my papers online like they ask. I do everything. And they still just go, yeah, sit down. We'll call you. And then they come out and go, do you need another appointment? Yes, thank you, please. I'll have another. Um, so, you know, always be nice. But um, get to know who the staff is. Because not only is the staff helpful about office policies and payment procedures, they can also sort of guide you to getting back, you know, getting an appointment you might want or getting a test schedule you might want. Um, when you're calling for an appointment, if you need some extra time, let the front desk know to schedule extra time for you. Because uh, honestly, the way practices are run now, you are expected to see your patients in X amount of minutes and move on. And they measure that. They measure how many patients you see and how long it takes you. So there's not a lot of time for dilly-dallying. So, but if you have a, a concern or you need more time, just say that and they can book it that way. And you have every right to ask for that. It's not a problem. What is a problem is if you come in for a routine appointment and then bring up you know, some huge major problem. Now, if you are left waiting and waiting and waiting in the office or even worse, I think, in the exam room, you need to tell the doctor. Because you can complain to that office staff all day, and they will say, you know, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with him. He's, sit he's sitting in there playing poker on his computer. I can't get him to go in and see the patient. <laughs> don't laugh. That's exactly what they're doing. Um, um, so say it, but, but say it nicely and respectfully, because if you don't tell the physician and make him accountable, no one else can make him accountable. If you've been waiting, and I've seen patients wait for two hours in exam rooms for, for doctors, and they'll do it week after week after week, and they'll never say anything to the doctor. They'll complain to everybody else, but they won't say anything to the doctor because they're afraid they're going to make the doctor mad, or what, you know, what are they going to do, not take care of you? Um, you need to say nicely, you know, doc, I know you're really busy, but you know, I've been waiting here for two hours, and I do this every week, and I really don't have this kind of time, or you know, for some of our patients, they don't have a lot of time. They certainly don't want to spend their time sitting in the waiting room waiting for you. But you know, say it as if, I don't know why you're late, but you're late every week. Is there some, other, is there some way we could schedule this so I don't have to wait two hours because I just I don't have that kind of time to spend here? And you know, I, my time is important. So you say it to him as an equal, but you let them know what your situation is. But if you complain to the nurse or the, the medical assistant who's putting you in the room, they can't control that. They, they, they're not the ones that control what the doctor does. So you have to, you have to say something. But I, I find that people have very unusual expectations. Um, as I said, I, you know, I, I know physicians who make patients wait for very, very long periods of time. And I've even heard patients come from other cities who have gone to see specialists and they said, oh, well, you know, he's a very, very important doctor. And so I had to wait a really long time. Really? That's interesting because I don't think that's very respectful. But um, I was covering for one of my partners when it was a while ago, and he was notorious. He always was late. He was always running late. I was covering for him. I'm always on time. And at that time, I had young children, so I was really on time. I had to get out, get going. And so they put a patient in the room. I picked up the chart, walked in. Hi, I'm Dr. Beckhold. I'm here to see you. I'm coming for Dr. X. And they said, oh, well, we always have to wait for two hours for Dr. X. He's a very important doctor. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, well, thank you. It's nice to meet you, too. <laughs> and as soon as I'm finished with you, I'm going to go back and get my hair done, have some bonbons. But thank you. <laughs> um, so people have different perceptions that sometimes if they make, if, you know, if the doctor rushes in and they act like, well, I'm just very busy. They go, oh, you must be really important. I'm so sorry I'm taking up your time with my metastatic cancer here. Um, but <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way. We both need to respect each person's time. But honestly, if you don't complain to the right person, you will just continue to wait. But I, I, I think that this is getting better just because it's very oriented now towards customer service in healthcare. In, in healthcare situations, because remember, most of them are owned by big companies, and they are measuring quality and customer satisfaction. So when you do go to the doctor, what do you need to be prepared for? Always have to your insurance card. I was in an office the other day, and I heard them ask this lady for her insurance card, and her husband goes, "No, I didn't bring that with us." 
And I'm like, well, why wouldn't you? He goes, well, her social security number is blah, blah, blah. Um, if you have advanced directives, which hopefully everyone has, I have them, my children in their 20s have them, everyone should have them. It's not because we think you're gonna die tomorrow, but if you have any common sense, you will have an advanced directive. It's just like having your will for your estate. You've gotta have it. Uh, names of other doctors, if you're seeing other people, make sure you know, you know, so mainly because I want to copy my, my dictation and my medical record to your other physicians so they're always getting your medical records. Um, what is it that you want to ask about? Don't get in there and go, oh, you know, there was something I wanted to ask you about last week and now I can't remember what it was. Okay, time's up, baby, you gotta go. Um, so, you know, bring that one back next time because we don't have time for you to, so if you have questions, write them down. You know, if you're having symptoms, write them down. A notepad, so when you have a question, you have a way to write down the answer. I, it, it, honestly, if I had to get my air conditioner fixed and he was telling me what was wrong, I would have to write it down because I don't understand air conditioners. So if you don't understand, you know, a lot of things about healthcare and you have a question, write down the answer. There's nothing wrong with that. Then if someone asks you, you can say, oh, this is exactly what she said, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes I'll take it from them and I'll say, let me write this out because I know how to spell it and I will write things out in bullet points so when they talk to their family, you know, they can understand what we talked about. I do have patients who bring in their phones and we do Skype in the, in the office too, but you know, that's okay, whatever works. Um, arrive early, we've started actually, the way our appointments look, it looks to me like I have a, an eight o'clock appointment, that person's actually scheduled for 7.45 because they have to come in and fill out their papers. Because there's so much paperwork and all this stuff we have to put in the electronic medical record, um, make sure you have time for that, I know it's, really tedious, but we have to do it, um, especially if this is the first time you've been to that office. Many offices will send you the paperwork ahead of time. A lot of offices, you can even go online and fill out your paperwork. That's a great idea. If, they could, if, if you can do that, it'll make it much better and more likely to be accurate, because otherwise you're writing it down, taking it in someone else's, and putting it into the computer. So if you do it yourself, it's more likely to be correct. We've actually, thought about having little iPads that patients could take to their seat and put their information in. We thought about trying that. Kind of like when you go to the um, airport now, you don't talk to a ticket agent, you have to go to the kiosk because they don't want to be bothered with you. Um, but it actually is very efficient when you're working with electronic medical records. That's, that's really the reason to do it. Uh, we have to update your insurance all the time and honestly in this environment people's insurance does change frequently so we have to make sure we keep up on that because otherwise it leads to problems. Um, make sure you check um, addresses and contacts. Sometimes something happens, maybe you know like you're getting a treatment or you have an appointment and there's a power outage and we have to cancel your appointment and we can't get a hold of you because we don't have the right phone numbers or things like that. Um, also, your emergency contacts and who's on your HIPAA forms, you want to make sure that that's on there. Your HIPAA forms are the forms that um, list the names of people that you will allow us to speak to. It's very important that you have everyone's name on there that you want us to speak to because if their name's not on there, we will not speak to them. There are huge financial penalties if we do and we just can't do it. And no matter if it's your dear, dear family member, if you didn't put their name down, we can't speak with them. Make sure all your allergies and surgeries are up to date, and um, of course, your medications. Make sure, I know we always say that, but you know, if you're seeing more than one physician, your, your medications often will change. Um, just your formulary for your insurance may change, so you wanna make sure you know what you're taking and that we have accurate information. And it includes supplements. Sometimes when people are more supplements than they are regular medication, and those are important to, to, for us to know. Realistic expectations. I know we'd all like to have more time in, with the physician, but visits are usually scheduled 15 minutes or less. So you have to understand that that's your time in the um, actual exam room with the physician. So if you have a long list of questions or you think you need more time, again, request that beforehand. Also, how you manage your time in the, in the um, exam room is important. First of all, be honest, be open. Nothing embarrasses us. Honestly, I've looked at, I can look at any body part, it doesn't bother me at all. I don't even think about it being your bottom. Couldn't care less. 
It really, we are physicians. If you have something that's bothering you and we need to look at it, oh, look at it. It's not a problem. If you have something you want to discuss, talk about it. I, I guarantee you I've heard worse. And it wouldn't bother me at all to discuss things with you. So don't ever be embarrassed to ask about something. Definitely talk about the things that are bothering you right at the beginning. Don't wait until we've talked about your kids and the last trip you went on and then wrapping things up, starting to walk out the door and you go, oh, you know, I did want to tell you about this headache. It's the worst headache I've ever had in my whole life. And, you know, that's not the time to bring that up. So make sure you bring up your, your problems early on. If you're feeling rushed, you're worried, you're uncomfortable, you may want to say, Doc, do you wait a second? And I have heard of physicians who talk the whole time with their hand on the door knob, like they're ready to bolt as soon as they possibly can. You could say, uh, okay, I'm not going to bite you. You can take your hand off the doorknob now. You know, just make, a, make light of it, but make it clear that you realize that they're trying to get out the door. And you can say, I, I know you're really busy. I just have one more question. Or I know you're really busy, but I really need to understand what you just said because it kind of went over my head. It's okay to say that. Um, but if you really have lots and lots of concerns, um, you may need to have another appointment uh, or a follow-up. Um, but, but I really, I, it is appreciated when you say, I know you're really busy, I know you've got to get going, but, because it does acknowledge that the, uh, the physician has things to do. But you also, that's what you're there for, you're there for their time. So make sure you get the information that you need, but you have to start, you have to lead with what they need to hear so that they can address your concerns. So, you know, being organized about your complaints helps. Um, you know, think about it before you go in. Like, for, if, for example, if you're talking about pain, what is it that hurts? Where is it located? How does it feel? What's the type of pain? How intense is it? How long does it last? How often does it occur? What makes it feel better or worse? Do my symptoms affect my activity or limit me? You know, that looks like it it's, would take, you know, 10 minutes to get through all that. It can, you know, really in four sentences, you can probably get all that information across. But you sort of have to organize your thoughts a bit before you address it. So if you're having pain or uh, an issue or lightheadedness or whatever it is, think about it before you go in so you can explain it most clearly to the physician so that they can help you. Sometimes, especially for people who have serious illnesses, you want to bring a friend or a spouse to help you remember um, everything that was said, what was done, what's being planned. Uh, but that person should be a support to you. Um, I've had patients come in with a friend who was like an attack dog. Like, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Well, I looked this up on the internet and you didn't say anything about such and such. Okay, you're not my patient. I'm not responsible to you. And if you're going to bring in, you know, good cop, bad cop, you're going to set off a very bad relationship. So the person you bring in should be there to support you and say, um, you know, let me, you know, and maybe write things down for you and say, well, Sue, do you remember you wanted to be sure and tell the doctor such and such? You know, that's, that's great to have a support person like that. But, um, uh, and, and I never resent that. Now, if you bring 15 people in with you, that's going to be a problem. You know, nobody wants that. And it becomes disorganized. You have 15 people trying to give their opinion and add things in and it just becomes chaotic. But you know, certainly having you know, a, a spouse or friend, a uh, support person come in with you is a great idea, it's particularly when you're dealing with serious illness or um, you know, maybe have a family member with uh, memory issues or dementia, that person definitely needs someone to go in there with them to make sure that, that everything is understood. Remember, anytime you don't understand something, just go, oh, could you say that again? in regular language. Just, just ask, just, you know, um, there's no reason you can't ask and then repeat something and make it clear. Also, most offices have oodles of educational material that explain things. So just ask for some materials. Just say, do you have a pamphlet or a booklet or anything on that? Or do you have a nurse I could talk to that maybe could clear that up for me or something? Um, you know, we just have so many resources available um, for patients. The other place to look is uh, the drug company websites have a lot of really uh, um, detailed uh, educational information, can explain your medications, um, can explain your disease process. A lot of it's, it's can be really very helpful. So if you know who's making your drug, you can go to their website and get some help. So what if um, you're supposed to have a procedure or some surgery? 
Um, this is, you know, this is that's serious. You know, um, it could be somewhat minor surgery. It could be a very serious surgery. You need to be prepared to ask some questions. And I know it's very difficult to talk to surgeons sometimes. There can be sort of abrupt, like, oh, look, I know what I'm doing. Just let me do my do my job. But first of all, what's the rate of success of the operation? I mean, if there's only a one in five chance the operation is going to help you, you may not want to do it. So that's something you want to establish. Uh, do you do this procedure often? Most, most um, surgeons can tell you how often they, they do certain procedures. Um, and you, know, you may have to ask around. I mean, you don't have to commit to one person for a major procedure. You may want to ask around town to, you know, gee, do you know someone who does an anterior approach for uh, total hip replacement as opposed to the old uh, method? Ask around. You may be surprised what you find out. I mean, unless it's a, an emergency surgery, you should take your time, evaluate the situation, what your needs are, and what, uh, what your relationship is with that surgeon, and if you think that's the person who's best for you. What kind of problems can I expect? What kind of side effects might there be? What kind of things could possibly go wrong? You know, I, I mean, you know, there are lots of side effects. It's just like if you read the insert on a medication, you'd probably go, I don't think I want to take this. But you probably want to know what are the big problems, like, what are the most common problems that could, could, go, could come up with this? How much is this going to hurt? What kind of discomfort am I going to have afterwards? And what kind of things do you have to do to take care of that discomfort? What, what kind of anesthesia uh, is used? And what are the risks associated with the anesthesia? Those are fair questions. You just want to know. You maybe have a history of problems with certain kind of anesthesia, and there's a reason the anesthesiologist will certainly be asking you about that, but before you get that far along, you might want to ask, you know, you know, there may be options for you. You might want to know what they are. How long is the recovery? Maybe you're, you need to go back to work and you want to know, or maybe you have to have, you know, someone help you out. You need to know, what does the recovery look like? What's the rehab like? Do I have to go to a facility? Can I do this at home? Will physical therapy come to, see, to me? Do I have to go to them? How much pain is there? When, I, when can I get back to my normal routine, like doing all the things I like to do? Like, you know, if you're a tightrope walker, how, how soon can I get back to that? Um, what if I don't do the surgery? What's the, what's the downside if I don't do the surgery now? Could I wait six months? Those are all legitimate questions. And you shouldn't be rushed into anything. When you're talking about serious illness, I really think people don't ask enough questions and get real answers. Because I see too many Americans get chemotherapy cardiac caths, dialysis, and they probably didn't need to do it. Or maybe it really wasn't the best thing for them. Um, or they didn't know what it really entailed. You need to ask questions before, when you're seriously ill, you need to ask some hard questions and you need to be willing to hear the answer. That's the hardest part. But make sure you truly understand what the suggested treatment is. What are you committing to? And is, if I do commit to this, can I stop it? What's the time frame? The most important question, I think, for chemotherapy patients is, will this make me live longer? Honestly, why would you take chemotherapy if it wasn't going to make you live longer? And if it is going to make me live longer, how much longer? Because most of the new drugs that are being approved only have an improved survival of about four to six weeks. Many of them cost about $40,000 a month. The most significant toxicity from chemotherapy at this point is financial toxicity. So you need to ask some questions. And I'm not saying that, you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying that chemotherapy is bad. I give chemotherapy all day. I think it's a life-saving drug. But there are times when you're just, you know, you're, you're just trying to do something because you're, you're desperate. And you really have to, it, that's the time when it's most important to ask questions and make sure you understand what the options are. Because you may be choosing something that you really didn't want, and you've wasted your time and your money. People will bankrupt their families and end up with nothing but a lot of toxicity because they didn't ask any questions and they didn't get the right answers. So you have to be, if you are seriously ill, you need to make sure you ask the questions. People start dialysis on patients who are never going to improve their quality of life. They're going to be, on a, they're going to be bed fast going to dialysis, and never improve their quality of life. And then finally the patient gets to the point and says, I, I don't want to do this anymore. But their family somehow you know, talked them into it, or they felt like, well, nobody gave me a choice. Nobody said I could turn down dialysis. 
because it's certain death, but maybe that's better than what they're living through. So it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to evaluate, I'm in a really bad situation here. What, what's the best thing for me? What do I really want out of, out of this? You know, so make sure you understand what the side effects are. How much time in the office? Do you have to be in the office? You know, if you have a limited life expectancy, you may not want to spend all your time in the office. Simple as that. Do you have to be in the hospital for treatment? Most of our treatments for chemotherapy are virtually all as outpatients, but there are other treatments that have to be done in the hospital. You may want to know about that. And what is the cost? We have financial counselors now to help people with that because the cost is astonishing. And uh, people need help with that. They need help to understand. Medicine is the only thing I can think of where you go and sign up for something. You have no idea what it's going to cost you until you get the bill. And then you just have to pay for it, whether it worked or not. And if you die, your family has to pay the bill. So, I mean, if you go to the store or buy anything else, you know what it is before you buy it. But medicine is sort of like, well, we don't know exactly. Let's see what your insurance pays. I, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's the crazy system anywhere. Um, and so what if I don't do the treatment? I, and that's a question I get a lot from patients with cancer, with metastatic cancer. Often they'll say, so if I take the chemotherapy, you know, you've told me what that will do. What if I don't take any treatment? You know, how fast would I die? And we talk about that. And what would it be like? And sometimes it's better not to take the chemotherapy. And the time frame isn't that much different. So these are, these are really serious questions. I realize that. But it's also really important to ask these questions. And you need to make sure that your family understands that you want to know the answer if you're the patient. I, too many times, I, you know, patients are trying to ask questions and their family's going, no, dad, you're a fighter. You're fighting. She, he wants that chemotherapy. He, we want that chemotherapy for that dad. You have never, you have never backed down. You're always a fighter. I'm going to say, you know what? Let dad decide what he wants to do. It's not your choice. It's dad's choice. He's the one that's being treated here. So, you know, it's, it's really important that your family's on board and understands all these issues and not just you as the patient. It's okay to get a second opinion. If you have a really serious illness, uh, you know, anything, hearing two views from two different doctors help, may help you decide what's right for you. You know, you may hear a completely different perspective from, from a different doctor. I've had patients who say, well, oh, I understand everything now. You know, maybe I just said it differently. I don't know. Um, but sometimes it just helps to see a, a second person. And you may go back to your original doctor. They may both agree. They may say, this is exactly what you need. And you go, okay, great. Thanks very much for your time. Going back to my, my original doctor. That's fine. Um, I, you know, we're used to seeing second opinions. It's actually kind of fun because you get to get your, give your opinion. You don't have to worry about any problems they're going to have or side effects. You just get to be the guru and go, yes, that's what I would do. And they go, oh, thank you so much. Um, now, your doctor may suggest other doctors to review your case. That's okay. To me, that sounds like a really smart doctor. We have all these tumor boards where we sit down with multiple physicians from multiple specialties to discuss cases because we want to hear what everybody has to say. And, see, and, and that's how we learn and that's how we give the best care. Um, I had a patient not too long ago that she had a very unusual presentation of a common disease. And I, and I called her when I found out what it was and I said, you know, this is, this is just very unusual. You know, just never seen it present this way. It just seems very odd to me, very treatable, but it's just an odd situation. It's just an odd presentation. If I were you, I would go see someone who just sees this all the time and just see if they have anything else to say. And I set her up with someone at a, another cancer center out of town. And he said, yeah, that's what I would, it is odd, but I'd still just treat it the way we treat it any place else, which I can do in my office like anybody else. She stayed up there, and I kind of got the feeling she thought that I wasn't very smart because I told her to go see another doctor. I'm like, okay, whatever. Um, but I, to me, you know, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll get on the Internet and I'll shop, a, I'll shop a, a case around to some experts because I have their email address. And it's wonderful because you can just email these guys and they'll just email you right back going, yeah, this is what I would do. It's wonderful. Um, so to me, that's really great to be able to ask other physicians who are specialists um, in, in a certain disease what they would do and get their, you know, I tell my patients, I just got you three free second opinions. 
I think it's great. It's not because I don't know what to do or I don't understand this disease process. It's because, you know, if you were walking down the hall and you saw someone else in your specialty, you would go, oh, let me ask you about this case. It's really interesting. We do this all the time. But, uh, you know, if you can access the world's greatest expert on, you know, lobular carcinoma, you know, why not contact them? You do have to see if your insurance covers a second opinion, but they usually do. But you may need to get a referral, so don't forget to do that. So always remember you are in charge of your health and your body. You have responsibilities, but you also can have expectations of your physician and the healthcare system in general, and you should expect excellent care because that's what we, we really strive to give you excellent care. And if, the, if someone's not striving to give you excellent care, you probably need to change healthcare systems. We're here to educate you and help you make decisions. I'm not here to, I'm not the chemotherapy police. I don't make anybody do anything they don't want to do. I try to educate them and tell them what I think is the best thing for them to do. If that doesn't work for them, then we talk about alternatives and you know, other things that we can do. Know what your goals are and what your doctor's goals are, and hopefully they will be the same. No one wants to talk about end-of-life care, but it's so much better to talk about it before you need it. So do it when you're not emotional and you're rational. So you should have a living will, a durable power of attorney. Um, do not resuscitate orders is something that usually they, we talk about when people are very ill and doing um, cardiac resuscitation would not benefit them. If you're dying of lung cancer, putting you on a ventilator is not going to fix that lung cancer. It doesn't have any therapeutic effect, so you probably don't want to do that. Um, I'm always astonished that people who are in the hospice program and they are clearly very close to dying and they want to be a full code. And it's just, it's so difficult because we in the healthcare system know what that entails and how painful and pointless and terrible it will be for them, but they still say, nope, we want to be a full code. And so um, it's best to think about these things when you're thinking rationally and not emotionally. And think about what your end-of-life wishes are. Most people want to die at home, but in America, most people end up dying in a hospital or a facility. Um, you know, how do you feel about long-term care versus home care? Uh, you know, repeatedly hear families say, I always promised mom I'd never put her in a nursing home. Well, don't say that, because you may not be able to take care of mom. You may not be able to afford to have someone else come take care of mom. And a nursing home may be your best option. And there are a lot of wonderful nursing homes. So don't just say out of hand, I would never do X, because you just don't know what kind of situation might present itself and you don't know what you might need. And of course, hospice care from Hospice of Cincinnati um, is um, something that you should always be thinking about most. Private insurance covers it, Medicare certainly covers it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated medical benefit um, as far as how, they, how Medicare runs it, because it is Medicare, but it's it's an outstanding program. If you need it, or a loved one needs it, or a family member needs it, you, you just there's not there's no better part of the healthcare system than than that. Um, so make sure you, you you get your your affairs in order, and so you don't have to worry about them. God forbid something happens to you, it's already done. Um, so being prepared is is uh, is always better than being unprepared. And that's all I have unless you have comments yet. Yeah.